So Irving, um, we've just worked together on a book, um, The Dawn of the Akashic Age, um, and we've talked about how the latest in scientific understanding, the new sciences of non-locality relate to um, social life, relate to uh, the way the new era we're moving into. In the beginning of the book, we focused on these complex tipping points and how we've arrived where we are now. And so part of it is, is, is looking bleak because we're shown the disruptions in the system. But what we also endeavoured to do is to look beyond that. And we looked about what would we see as emerging as part of the Akashic era if we move through these chaotic disruptions. And what I feel is important is we, we wanted to show that what models would emerge if we, if we see this coherence, this non-locality manifesting in our, in our social, cultural systems and our human consciousness. So, um, there were, for example, one of the great shifts we saw was moving from vertical top-down systems into horizontal systems of integral connectivity, which really manifests um, um, alongside what we know in the new sciences, how everything is, is, a, is a quantum field and an Akashic field we talked about. So the models we discussed were emerging distributed systems, such as in finance and, and the shift towards uh, growing local economies and, and gift economies and other forms of both regionalized as well as larger economic systems. We looked at new models in energy as well, uh, using um, energy both that could be networked and localized energy rather and, and the grid system. And we looked at models in food distribution, food cultivation, and all these to, to give an example and transport as well. Um, because it's important we wanted to show is that the 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 way of that's coming through our understanding now of the new sciences of being integrally connected can and will we feel manifest in the physical cultural systems uh, in the years to come so that's why new that's why new sciences are, are paramount in that they're showing that interconnectivity and so we're seeing all these different levels now of how interconnectivity is the new the new model um, Evan, would you like to say something about the, the manifesting new consciousness that's coming through also? Well, let me just say, at the, at the very first in the initial impetus for this book was the idea that uh, at that time, I started reading, started writing it in 2012, that there was a widespread discussion whether the end of 2012 mm -hmm. will be kind of a, a point uh, beyond which we don't know what is going to happen. And we try to show that to some extent we can know what can happen. We won't know exactly how is it going to play out, but we know that there is a world beyond it and its world can be built in a positive way. So we try to show, as you say, that there are models, there are ways of conceiving our interaction, our cooperation in this world, which enable a, a better world, a more sustainable world to be created past this famous point. Of course, by the time we published this book and in 2013, we know that it's all behind us, that, that famous uh, uh, tipping point. But uh, even though it's not, it wasn't anything evident, so the whole world was all of a sudden going down or just stopping for a moment and they're restarting, uh, there may be a point, there may have been a point where some more fundamental changes got underway and these unfold in, the, in these months and these years that are, are in front of us. So we, our, our purpose was to show here is a possibility of a more generalized change in front of us, awaiting us, being opening up as a possibility, and how do we make use of it? The things that you are saying, I mean, these are the key elements of it. We we'll have to create a system that makes use of the energy, make use of the material resources, and use this information and technology to the best possible way. So the world that we first undertook to look at was the world of 2020. Mm -hmm. We're saying 2020 is famous for, uh, for standing for a perfect vision. Can we have anything like a vision of the future? 
and the beyond 2012 world uh, and 2020 world how that would look and there in this world, in this book with outline various elements of it the the economic uh, political social and technological elements of creating a world that is tenable sustainable and capable of evolving as they say nowadays as capable of thriving or flourishing and so this was the first point and then we even look beyond that to 2032 what kind of a world would we finally build on that level and perhaps you'll say something about how we can see the, how a world could ultimately be shaped that will be the worthy of the human spirit mm -hmm. yeah I mean, when we were coming together first on this book um, as you said over in 2012 we, we there was so much hysteria around the end of the world which we didn't we didn't connect with or, or buy into um, because another thing we wanted to, to put across in this movement this process which is unfolding between 2020 and even 2030 and onwards is that it's not going to happen overnight but in terms of evolutionary processes it's almost just like that because evolution works on a different scale on a much larger scale but in you know there was so much talk about is there going to be life in 2013, like in one day before and one day after everything changes? And so we want you to put in idealism with practicalities as well, vision with, with practicalities. And the practical side of it is that this change will take time. It's unfolding now. We can see it in the world around us, um, in many of our systems that are unfolding and recalibrating right now. And so this process will take years and also over generations. So looking at 2020 was in our, in our immediate sphere of what we can see unfolding now, um, looking at, at um, th th these emerging systems. And then, as you rightly say, we wanted to then take a little further step and see 2030, uh, when that would allow change to have taken more of a route. And importantly, it would also allow more the disruptions to play out because we need more time for some of the disruptions to play out for this recalibration to come in and so the the major areas you wanted to look at was how could politics um, economy and, and and human consciousness where would we see that in 2030 and I think the 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 central area of that was a the concept of participation a participatory society with a participatory consciousness because we we have the technology to engage people in the processes and so these systems which used to be more closed systems and especially we talk about politics and the top-down nature um, through the technology would allow people to participate in those processes and also as we as the Akashic age symbolizes a planetary society because everything connects. And many people have this, this fear that a planetary society um, equals a totalitarian society. But that's not the case. That's an important point to put across. Yes, yes. Is that in the old paradigm thinking, maybe that thinking, that fear would be there. But in the new energy, the new consciousness that is coming through, that doesn't allow for that totalitarian society because participatory consciousness is coming up through the people. So there will be a greater participation in regional politics, in engagement, and it doesn't have to be politicians in politics. It can also be the citizens and people from all walks of life. It's very important to understand that because the Akashic era is an era of interconnectivity, integral, that it, it, it is moving towards a planetary society. But the old model, the old mind of thinking, is fear of a totalitarian society. But the Akashic era will engage a participatory consciousness, a new energy of consciousness. And so it won't play into those old games of being totalitarian because it will, it will engage a distributed participation from the people in politics, in innovation as well. We looked at how innovation will be distributed. And that... That participatory consciousness was crucial for this, um, say, the new pillars or the declaration of consciousness. Um, would you like to say something about um, the Akashic era, probably the origins of, of the Akashic concept as well, Ovin? 
or what is clear is that if we are going to have a greater level of cooperation, we have to have the will for it. And it will not be sufficient of the re purely rational calculation of the advantages versus disadvantages, the costs and the benefits of cooperation. Too many people will have still stock, as you say, in the fear, also in the belief that this is a highly competitive world where dog eats dog, we have to be stand out, stand up for our own interests, and anything to yield our own interest for cooperation is actually against us, against our longer term uh, persistence and evolution. The new consciousness is a consciousness of belonging, of what the youth cultures today call the oneness, beyond the dualities of me versus the world, of one society against another, one company against another, one nation competing with others. Uh, we have to recognize, and we are recognizing, our greater joint shared interest. And this is a single world with a higher level of cooperation is required for that single world to be maintained on that global level. Ultimately, it's a global world. Information is now global. Technology is now global. Mm -hmm. Politics is stands way behind or it lags behind. But it is only a matter of time before the old politics shows how dysfunctional it is. And the, the mindset, the consciousness of people has to, has to catch up with the reality. The reality that we are already at a global age. Not a uniform age, not a top-down age, but an interconnected age. And that is the meaning, I think, of the Akashic age, the age where we can see a new kind of connection between people, which is inherent, which is, comes from the heart and not only from the mind, where we, people sense their connection, which is not a radical novelty, it's not a utopian, mm -hmm. because human societies have lived with this kind of connection through the millennia. We wouldn't be here if that wouldn't have been the case. Of course, there have been fights, there have been wars, there have been conflicts, but within any given community, there had to be a basic unity, whether it was a, a dictate of a higher authority, a divine authority, or whether it came from the feeling of love that, is, that people have developed because they've been sensing each other, at, uh, sometimes in these meditative altered states, these are coming forth, these feelings. But one way or another, these stronger bonding between people has been the rule rather than the exception in human society. Now we do not live in a tribal society anymore. We live in a global interconnected society. So this kind of bonding which produces empathy and, and instigates, encourages cooperation has to be reflected in our own thinking, in our own feeling. That means in our own consciousness. It is growing up. This is not an artificial, uh, abstract thought, utopian thinking. It is already it's happening. Our task is to accelerate this. And I think our book serves to some extent, to a major extent, to helping to people recognize that this is a necessity. That we have to feel differently, live differently, in order to survive and to thrive as a species. Otherwise, we are threatened as a species. So, to show these possibilities, to open up the vistas and allow people to say, aha, this is how I've been feeling at a deeper level all along, and begin to start to live this. I and mean, that would be the proper, uh, the good outcome of reading this book. Yeah, and we, we want you to show that the Akashic era can be a reality. It's already emerging. And the important thing is, is that it's an era which empowers people. That they don't have to wait for it to come along or, or sit and do nothing. The whole point of being integral and interconnected is that each individual's small actions can resonate in the whole. And that everything we do, not only our, our thinking, our behavior, even in smaller circles, can, can ripple out into the, into the whole wider the sphere. So it's important that... that this has a practical side to it. It combines both the way we think, our consciousness patterns, the way we perceive, and the very actions in life. It's integral in everything. And we're already seeing it. We're already seeing the shift from the models of conflict and competition and conquer towards coherence, consciousness, compassion. 
and the growing rise of empathy. And so we, we've, this corrects exactly with what we felt was, was represented millennia ago with what the Indian Rishis talked about in the mm. connective field of the Akasha. What the, the new sciences show in non-locality and entanglement, nothing is new, but now's the right time for it to emerge and for everybody to participate and take it forward and to vision it to make it a reality because together we can make it so. That is the gist of it. We try to illustrate that this possibility exists, that this is our evolutionary destiny mm -hmm. because the alternative to that is breakdown, is a serious threat of species extinction. Other species and even the human species ultimately are a large part of it. And this is not going to happen because a new culture, a new consciousness is rising in the world. And we have written this book to show that this consciousness is a real possibility. It can inspire actions, structures, behaviors, institutions that respond to the need to create a global level society where there is unity through its diversity. Mm -hmm. It's a, it used to be considered an ideal concept, but the time has come when we either realize this or we suffer very serious consequences. So we trust that by showing that it can be realized, we help people to go ahead and realize it. And we'll prove it can be realized because in 2030 we'll come back and write the next book. <laughs> we'll try our best.